Um, I am very lucky uh, to work with Derek, and I have done so for seven years at the University of Dundee. I know Derek to be a digital champion in our institution and nationally. Also, I know Derek to be somebody who's very passionate about equity of access to high quality education for all our children and young people. Um, so today I'm really interested to, to hear, and I'm sure you are too, um, Derek's various hats, but, but specifically I guess as a digital champion in, in relation to all the changes that we're undergoing today. To give you a wee bit of background about Derek, Derek started his career as a teacher back in the 1990s. Derek, is that right? Oh, if you're you're on mute, Derek. Can you unmute yourself? Need to unmute yourself, Derek. Bottom left hand. I'll carry on talking. I'm unmuted, Derek. No, yeah, 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 yes, there we go. I, I, that would have been extremely embarrassing. I didn't, th I didn't think I muted myself. There's one here is a digital champion, and I'm not unmuted. What a start! <laughs> I uh, am delighted to have had to tell you where to unmute yourself as well on the screen. So yeah, primary teacher back in the nineties, you started, Derek, didn't you? Yes, that's correct. Nineteen ninety four, I started teaching in Whitfield Primary School uh, in Dundee. Yes, primary four, I started teaching. But you then moved on and became a staff tutor in IT for Dundee City Council before joining Dundee University as a lecturer on our initial teacher education programmes. Um, you then left Dundee to go and be the National Advisor for Emerging Technologies at what was then Learning Teaching Scotland, and you stayed long enough for two years of Education Scotland. And then more recently, uh, you came back to us at University of Dundee, and now you're a Senior Lecturer and Discipline Lead for Teacher Education. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, I guess the, the most obvious question then is, is what's your take on the current situation, you know, with COVID-19 and how things are um, changing in relation to, changing as well as of this, this morning, in relation to our educational establishments, schools, uh, early education and universities as well? Uh, well, I'll answer that in a second, Carrie, but before I do, can I just thank everybody for signing up today and coming along to hear me chat along with you, Carrie. Uh, I'd like to say everybody that if they have any questions or points they'd like to raise and uh, over the course of the session, uh, please do. But I really appreciate you coming along today and thanks to Sira for giving me the opportunity to do this. Uh, I think it's incredible what we've seen, uh, this change in landscape, this shift that's been caused by the pandemic, by the COVID situation. I've been involved in digital teaching and learning for 21 years now and, and I cannot believe what's happened in a matter of weeks. Uh, I, I have been one of these people that's attempted to, to try and persuade, cajole, encourage people to think about what digital teaching and learning can, can bring to the table with varying degrees of success. However, give me a, I'll just give you one anecdote here. Um, I chaired the, the Technology Enhanced Learning Working Group uh, at the university, at our school, the University of Dundee. And one of our aims for the year was to get our colleagues interested in Microsoft Teams. Uh, and within three weeks of the lockdown, everybody was not just interested in Microsoft Teams, but, but in it and using it, you know? And so it's kind of like, this is really kind of, the pandemic situation has, has precipitated a, a scenario where we're seeing people in spaces now and they've come to the table. Uh, we're seeing questions asked about blended learning, like PMQs. There was a discussion about blended learning on the radio the other day. We've got colleagues on our Teams channel now voluntarily leading inputs for other staff colleagues on various digital technologies that we're going to be using in the very uh, in the next academic session. I also mm -hmm. saw on Facebook the other day, Kari, uh, an, a seminar for outdoor learning in mathematics, and over 2,600 people had signed up to it. People wow. have now come to the table, and it's about what we're going to do with it now. Mm -hmm. And what about the technology? So the technology versus the pedagogy issue, Derek. What do you think about that? Technology versus the pedagogy issue. Well, I think I think before we get there, we've got to think a wee bit about how do we manage manage this change. You know, uh, uh, we need to be careful how we how we how we actually approach this. Now that we've got people to the table and people are using things, and and I'll talk a bit about more of the teachers later on in terms of how I think we're seeing them use things. I think we need to think about how ready we are. To, to think about the technology versus the pedagogy aspect of things. There's, 
there's long been the promise of transformation with technology. You know, and I'm not entirely sure it's been realized over the years. We've spent so much money on all the different tools and applications and peripherals, et cetera. And really what has been the kind of bang for buck on that? And you can go back to people like Larry Cuban when he talked about the impact that technology was supposed to have with TV and he found that it really didn't have it. Tom Conlon from the University of Edinburgh talked about this with Glow back in 2008, I think it was. He called it the dark side of Glow. And he talked about the appearance of interest and change at the surface level, but deep underneath it, there really isn't. So I think there's aspects that we need to look at, look at there. Uh, Carrie, you may know as well, we need to think about this because you and I initiated, uh, and, and with Brenda uh, Keach as well, our colleague, uh, we initiated an e-portfolio uh, with our undergraduate students on our teaching education program. And the, just to let colleagues know, what we did was we used the WordPress tool within Glow to give our students an e-portfolio to help them manage or to help them document their progress against the standard for provisional registration as they went through their four years with us. Mm -hmm. So we had all worked out in terms of how the technology would work. And we had the categories all linked to the standard for, for provisional registration with the GTCS. And it was all perfect with the technology. However, we found that there were barriers to this because uh, we didn't fully understand. We made assumptions about how people would engage with it. We made assumptions that because we built this technological thing that was all working perfectly, we didn't really make, uh, we didn't really fully appreciate how it Im impact on people socially, uh, psychologically, culturally. And as a result, it wasn't used as well as we, as we thought it would. And Carrie, you'll know about this as well. We found that students were reluctant to post for a variety of reasons. They were, they were a little bit concerned about how they might frame themselves in a public setting, what people might write on their posts, etc. Uh, and I know we've got one student, uh, one of our students who was involved in this, who was actually quite a prolific blogger and who was really took to it uh, in terms of the e-portfolio. But we learned a lot of things about assumptions we were making. And I think we need to be careful with that as well in terms of how we adapt to this. Because through all this, I think what we're needing is a, how can I describe it? We need to acknowledge this in a supportive way in terms of how teachers are getting to grips with this. We, what we need is a non-hubristic collegiate culture that helps us create what I would maybe call a grammar of understanding of how we best use these technologies at this time. Okay. That's quite a nice, uh, a nice phrase that sums it up really well, actually. Um, I guess the challenge then I would put to you is, is there a roadmap? Can you conceive of such a roadmap that would enable us to do that? It does require a lot of people, some people perhaps to be the leaders, um, to show the way for others. But as you say, the, this collegiate aspect of working together. Well, I, I'm very much somebody who's involved in, in social media and connecting. And I'll talk a bit about more about how the, the initial teacher education providers are connecting uh, in, a, in a, a digital manner, maybe later on in the, in the discussion. But I, like I, I shared a link to a wakelet I made uh, it's in the chat, folks, and I've got a lot of uh, links to courses, articles, uh, interviews that people can start to engage with to maybe help develop their understanding a bit more about what lockdown learning stroke, blended learning, if I can use that term, because that's quite contentious as well in terms of how people might just, uh, how can I put it, almost like substitute what we've done face to face in a digital space now. So we need to be careful how we actually view things like blended learning. But, I, I, you know, I, I hesitate to say that to have a, a fragmented approach, uh, like myself posting things, uh, colleagues, other colleagues posting uh, links or uh, wakelets, etc. It would be good someplace to have a bit more leadership, I think, nationally, in terms of advice about what in, informed uh, advice and guidance about what the research says about practice in these digital spaces. So I think we really could maybe do with that a bit more than there is. Uh, but I think we're, we've all found ourselves in this position where we're learning together, and I think that we need to acknowledge that and see how best we can support each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Derek. I'm just going to go to the comments now um, and, and read out a few things. As the comments box is filling up a wee bit. A couple of folk have posted some interesting points that we could maybe consider. Um, so Paul Adams was saying one of the issues that the technology, I'm just going to read a few of them out and then we can ponder them is one of the issues that the technology becomes the focus rather than the pedagogy or dare I say it, the andragogy. Um, Andrew Bailey is saying it was, if it was easier and even with technology we would already have done it. 
for Andrew, it's increasingly seeing the learning and teaching as the key parts and then how the technology can help with that. So all of those are certainly things that the students are aware of in terms of how they post and interact. Um, Sharon, who's a, a primary teacher, Sharon Medir, I think we're seeing that as a profession now, Sharon. So what you were referring to when you typed that was that kind of collegiateness, I think, um, and that, that willingness to engage. So Paul is now then saying, do we therefore need to ask questions about the ways in which we approach this interface between pedagogy and professional learning? Um, well, can I maybe address some of those? Mm -hmm. I, I think I kind of agree with everybody there, and I think Paul and Andrew are making really valid points. Uh, the, can I just maybe talk a bit about higher education, early years, and maybe in, in, in primary, secondary education as well, in terms of uh, how we maybe think about this? Uh, at the University of Dundee, and I'm sure colleagues in other universities as well are thinking about this, we're having to think long and hard uh, about the development of a, a strategy to ensure that although there's going to be face-to-face -face learning, there's very much going to be online learning as well, this kind of blended learning approach. Blended learning, I think the people who are very much uh, are expert in that field, who've written about this for ages, kind of, and I know they get a bit vexed uh, when people talk about almost changing face-to-face -face, uh, into some kind of digital and all of a sudden it makes it blended. But so I'm conscious of that, but I think we need to start someplace in order to take it forward. What we've done at the university, folks, is that uh, We've taken a lead from UCL's ABC model. Now, they call it arena blended uh, content method, right? That's what they call it. And uh, what they do is they, they're getting, the, we're going to be looking at storyboarding our almost like a, a learning journey through a module, so to speak. And in storyboarding that, we need to think about how we, uh, the different uh, range of activities, learning activities, and the way in which we get people, the students, to engage with the learning on this so that it's not just a, an hour-long lecture from Derek Robertson, then uh, with maybe a discussion board. Uh, that is very much in concert. What they use with that is Diane Laura Lard's, uh, it's based on her conversational method, uh, and it's like six learning types she's got. And so those range from, what is it again, acquisition, to inquiry, to discussion, to practice, collaboration, and production. So the University of Dundee is, and we're going to be building almost templates and guidance that's going to be shared across the school that each school will adapt, no doubt, that will help us inform our understanding about how to prepare our online materials in a more, hopefully, effective way to, to, address, to address the situation. If I go to early years, I was speaking to a couple of colleagues this week who are early years teachers, and you think about what does that then mean for teaching in the early years as well? It's such a challenge, particularly primary one, primary two, if the children can't read, et cetera. There's so much you need to do that would be taught face to face. So ask real questions about how do we connect with the home? How do we connect with their parents and guardians in terms of communication with them and how we support the learning that's happening at home uh, that complements what happens in the class when they come in for face to face, et cetera. I also maybe raise a provocation here in terms of the platform you're using for children in primary one, primary two, primary three. You know, if you look at both Microsoft Office 365 through Glow and G Suite to some extent, uh, are these the most appropriate platforms for young children to be in? You know, that kind of uh, maybe more formal space. I I've had a history in the past, which was very much part of my identity, was looking at the world of computer games and learning. And we've added research involving looking at games such as Nintendogs on the Nintendo DS, if anybody remembers Nintendogs, and how young children aged five and six can engage with the complexities of those worlds quite readily. Uh, we've even seen it with things like the game Minecraft, where young people yeah. aged five, six, and seven are in these spaces really controlling it. And I'd, I'd maybe think that there used to be a game called Moshi Monsters, for anybody who remembers Moshi Monsters. It was almost like a VLE for young children. Maybe we need to think about the way in which we present learning to young people that allows us to acknowledge their kind of the social dimension of, of who they are, their cultural aspects, and in spaces in which they can maybe have some more control and ownership of how they engage with learning in a space that they're comfortable in. Uh, and, and lastly, Carrie, uh, I've been speaking to colleagues as well about how we look at preparation for online learning and maybe further up the primary school and into the secondary school. And a couple of people that I'd maybe recommend to people that they read a bit more about are people like uh, Paul Kirshner uh, and people like Daisy Christodoulou. Paul Kirshner, in fact, I watched him, I've been, I've 
been referring to his work with my students for the past few years now uh, in terms of uh, medium to longer term memory, what we know about how people learn and how they retain information and knowledge uh, and, and it stays with them. So we've been looking at that in terms of things like retrieval practice, etc., and how we can use tools like Kahoot, Mentimeter, Forums, Quizlet, all these kind of things, and how we can use that to help uh, build it into our practice. But in fact, there's a fabulous video of Paul Kirshner on the Wakelet that I put there, where he talks about 10 tips uh, for lockdown learning. Uh, and I, I, can, I, I can only recommend people have a look at what Paul says there, because I think that's really interesting how he frames a lot of his, of, of his ideas that would be practically transferable to how people create their online learning materials. Daisy Christodoulou as well, folks. I've got, I've got her book someplace. Uh, it's a new text called uh, Teachers Versus Tech. And again, it's a kind of a research informed understanding of what we know about how people learn and how that, what that then means for us as we then apply what we know uh, in, the, in the design and the creation of learning spaces using a variety of digital tools. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Um, I'm going to go back now. Again, there's quite a lot of comments coming in. If anybody does wish to to ask Derek a question directly, do feel free to to yeah. type up, take yourself off mute, folks. Um, there's a few comments coming in about uh, pupils actually engaging quite well, um, but some I'm trying to find it now. Somebody made quite an interesting point about how do we ensure inclusion with a blended learning approach. Um, and, and, and bringing in vulnerable children, um, which I think perhaps teachers are finding that, that the lockdown has been making it more challenging for access. So Sharon Adir, who posted earlier, for instance, it says, so an issue about consistency across sectors, particularly in time of transition, and a second issue is access for vulnerable families. Um, and Gabriella, uh, sorry, Gabriella, if I mispronounce your surname, Rodolico, has uh, said, how can we ensure that blended learning is going to be also inclusive and what type, type should it be, what should it be to allow universities to guarantee access to higher education, for instance, and also to the most disadvantaged students? Um, and also a little bit more about is, is technology the gateway to, to learning or is technology specific aspect of technology in itself an aspect of learning? These yeah. aren't questions, Derek. It's just things to ponder, I guess. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, you know something? I think a lot of what people are asking uh, are questions I've been wrestling with as well. I mean, there's even one there from Paul Adams talking about perhaps the question is how we shift from learning, which might be argued as an individual activity and in as much as is presented in policy, to education and essentially social activity. The situation then becomes a socio-political one rather than simply a cognitive one. Paul, I've just uh, put in a, an article uh, that I discovered, I think, only last night, that I think would be really worthwhile reading on that because it's about how a university in, uh, in the States completely changed their curriculum and the way in which they presented their curriculum to learners. And they talk very much about this kind of socio-political change in the way in which people engage with learning, the way in which the learners were viewed and what the role of the lecturer was. So I, I do think you're right. I think this is forcing us to, to change our perspectives, our understandings of what it means to be a teacher or an educator. We've, we've been not wrong-footed, but there's, we, this has hit us. This has made us change the way we view things. Uh, and so, yes, I think there's lots of questions going to be asked here. Um, another point there that's been made by Katrina Oates is that assumptions are made about the suitability of a lot of the tools we're currently using. So actually we're potentially transposing tools designed for business such as those by Microsoft into education. Any views about that, Derek? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think that, I th you know, there is that kind of, you could view it as a kind of a neoliberal perspective about preparing young people for business and the Microsoft tools uh, are, are con con contributed to that. You could even say the same about Google tools, etc. That's why I was making a point earlier about the, the, the platform that I was maybe suggesting that young that young children might be better placed to engage with. But uh, listen, those tools are, are, are what they are, and I, I, I don't want to say I prefer one against the other. I think the, I think the affordances of both, uh, if used, if we actually focus on, let's say, a, a minimum of the tools as opposed to using the whole suite in Office 365, for instance, I think the way in which, uh, I know that Aberdeen City, I was speaking to Charlie Love uh, last night, actually, who, who manages the teaching and learning aspects through their Google platform, in Aberdeen City, and he was talking very much about the messages they were giving to teachers 
uh, about the use of a, a small uh, selection of the toolkit, the tool set initially when they were running, when they were introducing these things. So I think that we need to think about, although we get access to the whole gamut of tools within Microsoft 365, for example, in the below, we maybe need to think about Sorry, how Derek, make... I apologise for interrupting you. Could somebody please mute their mic because we're getting quite a lot of background noise over the, top, over the chat. Sorry for yeah. So I, so I do think there are issues there with uh, the, the 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 tools. I do think I do think Katrina's got a point, and I think she, yeah, that's something for us to, to have discussions about. Uh, a final point is coming um, about making sure about practical subjects. So again, um, people across the different ages and stages, but those perhaps that are maybe teaching a more practically focused subject, how how do they manage this? For instance, well, things that might be teaching labs yeah, alongside. I wanted lectures. to bring up. Sorry, Carrie. I wanted to bring that. I thought that was a question that came through really interesting. And as a as somebody who is involved in the teaching physical education, that's our concern within physical education. That we our concern is, you know, Joe Wicks is being touted as the physical education teacher and teaching physical education. But for us, that's not that's physical activity. That's not teaching physical education. So, and it's not just physical education but there's other practical subjects and it's back to that question of pedagogy and it, what about the physical nature of teaching and learning and using an online context Derek? Well I, I don't know if she's in. I knew, she, I knew that uh, my colleague Gillian Bartle had uh, signed up for us but I don't know if Gillian is actually in. Gillian's one of our colleagues at the University of Dundee who, uh, who, who leads I'm on. Here. This. Hello Gillian. Hello. <laughs> Gillian. Hi. Well, Gillian, do, I mean, you, were, you and I were discussing the other day about how you have adapted your practice uh, as a result of being found in a position where you had to do PE teaching online. Uh, I, I was speaking to Ailey Slattery as well, who teaches dance. So there was, I had my one colleague teaching dance, one colleague teaching PE, and both were talking about how they had to make, uh, had to accommodate this change with their practice. Gillian, do you maybe want to share with colleagues what, what you did? Yeah, but I would um, probably share concerns that Nicola's probably feeling in that there are certain things that you just cannot achieve unless you have, for want of a better term, touch <laughs> with the students, with the teachers learning to be, for example, supporters of children in the class environment. You know, you, this is um, to, for our teacher education students to learn how to be safe. So you can avoid those practices, of course, for now, while the COVID is going on, but um, eventually we will need to get back to some kind of um, normal physical interaction like that. What I did, though, that you're referring to, Derek, was with um, was very last minute, very quick learning curve, and it was um, using the learning platform, the virtual learning platform, for the students to go off and watch whatever clips I thought were educationally appropriate for physical education, not Joe Wicks. Um, and they had come to me then with ideas. I set out the sessions so that there were lots of breakout groups. Um, we came back together, they shared, they'd nominated a spokesperson. So a lot of it was just what you would do online in terms of interactivity anyway. Um, but in the breaks, some of them were going away and practicing things like their gymnastics conditional shapes and things conditioning shapes and things like that. So um, that was the first thing I did. Uh, the other thing was that I tried to get the students to think about what they could get their pupils to do. So for example, uh, differentiated learning, using lots of um, activities that the, the, you get the pupils to do, such as throwing and catching. Can you throw to a certain target? You know, can you make it slightly more challenging? How would you do that? So there's a lot of reflection with the pupils. Um, and you, can, you have to tailor it so that pupils can use things that are in their homes. Um, you know, you can't, you can't yeah. expect them to have rackets. And so it, it was about that kind of discussion and about the students uh, that I was with online trying to think of, of creative ways of getting their pupils to work. Smashing. Gillian, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Uh, can I actually ask, there's Andrew Bailey also, who, who I think is a, a science teacher from Angus. Uh, and Andrew, you, you've asked if you could maybe say something about how you're teaching uh, physics in, in this situation. Um, Did you want yeah. to say something? Yeah, um, you know me. Oh. A bit like you, Derek. Good for a blever. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, um, we've been doing. I've been doing experiments for the kids at home, so uh, we've got things um, about uh, you know getting them to work out density of things, uh, tins of beans, and uh, uh, density of materials at advanced higher, or even that national uh, third years have done uh, water waves traveling in a tray. You know, just a baking tray that you drop and lift and time how long the wave takes to go along. So I think there are things that you can do practical wise. Um, I think part of the problem I've found is that teachers are pretty fixed in the mindsets and they have an order that they do things. And a lot of teachers have done the same thing rather than actually thinking, yeah, that's the bit with all the practical in and I can't do that very effectively just now because I don't have the practical stuff. Um, so there's some bits of our course that suit, that suit more than others. Um, and so I think people have maybe not made the right choices necessarily. Um, the other bit I was going to say on the different thing rather than, a, rather than the practical point was um, there's some colleagues in primary one um, who are using Microsoft Teams with a primary one class and OneNote and, and out, the kids are posting announcements, announcements, the kids are uploading videos, the kids are uploading all sorts of stuff. There's, so you know, whilst I accept, you know, that requires the teacher to be quite fluent, to teach the kids how to do some of that. I think it's good to have a choice of lots of different ways of doing things rather than just uh, prescribing one, one way of doing stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I would say it's an actual quite a strength that we've got within Scotland, the GLOW setup, albeit that it's maybe not perfect because it's not very, totally flexible because you've got to get agreement from all the local authorities um, and having a national platform has been really helpful because um, you know it has allowed there to be a significant number of people uh, operating but more, although there are some you know higher level training and things I think you know a lot of my learnings come from other teachers and a more kind of grassroots uh, system and agency uh, of the men from just trying it out rather than yeah, you know, more formal structures. I think the vision Thanks for Glow. Very much. I think the and vision for Glow, Andrew, way back when. When was it? Now was it two thousand and three, two thousand and four? It was procured. Uh, you know, yeah. I was I was involved in that to some extent. Two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, when it was launched, etc. The vision for it was always very strong. I think the it was almost like a how can you put it? Was it the vanguard? of trying to position digital teaching and learning in, in the heart of the teaching profession. It's taken lots of bumps and bruises over the years. It's been, it's been criticized, it's clunky, et cetera. But I think it's in as strong a place as it's ever been with the range of tools. I mean, you've got access to G Suite, you've got Office 365, you've got WordPress available there. You know, there's a lot of stuff within Glue, I think that, that is really, can be really helpful for teachers and for learners. Uh, and so it's almost as if it's taken this situation for people to really see its purpose and its strength I think the last time I saw such an interest in Glow was in 2010 when we had that really bad winter, if you remember, and everybody mm. was, it was like locked down because of the snow. So it's maybe making sure that we don't, once we come out of this, that we don't go back to viewing the technology as only used in emergency situations. I think that's a real challenge for us. I think that one of the things that you would have noticed is that because you're at home using your own IT and your own broadband connection, you're actually able to use it if I was in my classroom right now, I couldn't do half the things that I can do at home because the IT infrastructure and the computer and the software that's Office 2010 is just not suitable. Thanks very yeah. much, Andrew. Um, Derek, I'd like to come back in and, and ask specifically then, um, how do you think we can use digital like, how can we use digital technologies to support like purposeful, meaningful learning content? Maybe, oh, sorry, you can't hear you, Carrie. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, can you say that again, Carrie? Carrie, Carrie, if you can unmute yourself, because I muted everyone again. Sorry. Yeah. If you could give us some examples, in your opinion, how we could create purposeful and meaningful learning context using digital tech as, as the medium um, for our children and young people. Goodness, Carrie. Goodness. You put me on the spot there. Goodness. Put you on the spot. Uh, 
Yeah, you have. Look, well, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that. Uh, I think that can be in such a range of a range of ways as well. I think that, and in doing that, what I think we need to also remember, which I don't think we've maybe touched on today, is that we need to remember the learner in all this. That they're mm-hmm. not just like some kind of like person just sitting there. We need to understand or acknowledge uh, the learner in terms of how we can use digital tools that are also relevant and culturally uh, meaningful to them. Uh, I, I, there was an article in the in the wakelet that I put in there, folks, about it was from the Guardian talking about teachers using TikTok. Uh, you know, as something they can maybe use as a way into learning. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, you can do this. I mean, TikTok, folks. I don't know if you've seen it. Well, no, no doubt you have seen it. It's like it's it's huge, isn't it? We've got somebody. I think Paul Adams, for instance, one of our colleagues here. I think he did a TikTok that went viral, had thousands of views. For goodness sake, you know. And, but when I look at TikTok. I, I see how really clever the way the way in which some people are using these things. It may be that what teachers can use is possibly use things like TikTok and to present challenges to young people that can then be used as the basis for further discussion, further learning, developing rubrics about success, etc. That may be ways in, and there's ways in which teachers can do this. I, I did this with uh, computer games folks uh, way back when, but I did it recently with Minecraft, and and I think that. I'm talking about spaces like that, Carrie, where, uh, and I know that lots of schools have access to tools such as Minecraft, etc. I mean, John Johnson's one of the teachers that I follow online as well. Uh, John was responsible for the development of Glow Blogs, but he's been writing about Minecraft in his class also. And I think the way in which we can maybe use these spaces where young people's like cultural identities, their, their histories in person, where they're seen as more than just a classroom learner can come to the fore here and be used in the range of tools in which they're expert also, which in doing that allows them ways into traditional curriculum, such as uh, a, a literacy, literacy, such as numeracy, such as social studies. One of the things that we did, and no doubt colleagues can do this in their own uh, local context, we, we got children to in Dundee to, to reimagine, redesign and rebuild what they thought the new Dundee waterfront should look like. And it was set against a set of uh, design criteria that the children then had to look at, think about, and then respond to as they then built Minecraft. And in Minecraft, this new Dundee waterfront that they thought would be appropriate. And we found out so much about that in terms of how the children uh, uh, showed themselves as learners beyond their classroom identity. And I think that's something that we can maybe think about uh, in, in relation to how we're engaging the children with a range of tools. And I think that what this needs to do is it maybe needs to help us understand that we maybe need to go beyond the range of tools that are maybe, I think Katrina uh, alluded to them being business tools. You know, I don't think we're just mm-hmm. about preparing children for the world of work. We're not just about preparing them to fit into the economy. Uh, it's about helping them become effective learners. It's about helping them realize their potential, allow their identity, the rich identities as learners beyond school to be given a chance to flourish within the school. So for me, I'm hoping that a situation like this is going to enable us as teachers to maybe go beyond their vision of what it means to be, the, the range of tools that we would use in education, to maybe think about the range of tools that would allow children to, to, to maybe become more than they are as a classroom learner in our more traditional settings. Thanks, Derek. Um, I'm going to invite Paul Adams to come in if you would like to, Paul. Paul, you've posted a few things about really um, a much broader way of conceiving the discussion in relation to policy issues and socio-political issues. Are you, would you like to come in and, and contribute? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy, always happy to, to contribute, you know me. Um, <laughs> Barrett, you've got two minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I can fill two minutes easily. Um, it, it, I've written about technology way, way back, and one of the things that always struck me when I wrote, which was in the mid-2000s and in 2011, was the way in which technology was seen as an addition to what we do in the classroom. So I think back to a policy that came out at the back end of, of New Labour, um, we're talking about the way in which technology could augment uh, learning and teaching and the example that was given was basically somebody doing something with an interactive whiteboard that they could have done with an acetate and some overlays mm-hmm. so I mean there was nothing there in terms of changing pedagogy changing education transforming the classroom it was it was nonsense to be perfectly honest with you and, and I just wonder whether uh, what we're seeing 
with technology and what we need to see and certainly through the, the covid situation it is a is is understand that what we actually have to do is begin to transform education broadly conceived because there's so much emphasis on individual learners gaining skills and, and, and demonstrating that through tests and through particular uh, ways of working that I think we've lost sight in many respects of the wider social, political and cultural aim for education. And although politicians will talk about closing the achievement gap, essentially what they're talking about is getting more kids to pass tests. Now, whilst in itself, there's probably nothing wrong with that, it doesn't actually challenge the way we understand education and the, and, and the way that we conceive of education as a social good. It's still a private good rather than a social good. And I just wonder whether technology and the COVID situation is an opportunity for us to say, actually, you can have compassionate and humane uh, um, uh, uh, solutions to education. Um, that that ask that require us to think much more broadly about our aims for education and our aims for young people, because you know we we've all thought about education in different ways during this lockdown. Well, lots of us have, not everybody probably, but but lots of us have thought about education in different terms. And actually, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually a very good thing. So it's how do we capture that and how do we keep that going so that we actually transform education rather than slipping back to what we had before and simply using technology to be more whizzy and more whatever, you know, which, which I, I, I think is a, a, a potential problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, Paul, I, listen, there's so much in that and uh, that we could, we could discuss further. I remember being at the Scottish Learning Festival in 2006 when GLOW was being short, sh shown to everyone. And one of the main things that it was, uh, one main, the main benefits was that it would cut down on uh, teachers, uh, the time to, to do things. It was, it was a focus on, it was almost performative aspects that it's going to cut down on your time. Uh, you can just search for worksheets. You can, you, you'll get this when you search into GLOW, which never really happened. You know, as opposed to thinking about what it means in terms of how we, how it impact on how we are as teachers and, uh, and what teaching and learning actually means. And I think that for a number of years, there's been kind of policy messages that have been relayed via a number of different sources from the macro to the meso to the micro level in classrooms, which I think we need to be uh, cognizant of and that we maybe need to start challenge more, challenging more. Because if I, if I can come back to this, I think a lot of that has been about, there was a time when, for instance, when I, was, uh, when I worked at national level and we were putting in things like Nintendo DS, Xbox, PlayStation, etc., that, that challenged the perspective of what it, the range of digital tools that people would use beyond an interactive whiteboard that in many ways was ended up using, uh, it was almost like, a, how can you put it, perpetuating a paradigm of the teacher at the front speaking to the class. Now, I know that there are people who are big whiteboard fans uh, and who who went on a range of courses etc and who were able to use it the, all the functionality on it very very well uh, but for a lot of people also there was this sense that it became like an electronic blackboard to some extent so uh, I think that we need to think about as we move forward from this uh, ways in which I, I come back to the point about Minecraft Paul that in my research that I did with uh, for, for my ongoing uh, studies uh, uh, with Minecraft one of the children in Dundee said the phrase that uh, since the Minecraft project started, I felt at home in school. And I said, you felt at home in school? She said, yeah, it's the first time that I felt at home in school for quite a long time. And, and I think, we, coming back to that point, Paul, I think our, policy, uh, our policies need to acknowledge and recognize that our learners aren't coming from a social vacuum, that they're very much, their identities and their histories of identity are rich and purposeful to the extent that they can bring so much to the table in terms of what they can already, they already know and what they can do. And I think it's incumbent upon us to maybe view ways in which we can take that on board so we can create a more inclusive curriculum and pedagogy that allows that to come to the fore. I mean, for, 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 for me, uh, it, it, what's come about through uh, the, the present situation is that we are seeing challenges to what it means to be a teacher and we're seeing challenges to what it means to, to what education means and we're seeing challenges 
to how we actually uh, validate or credentialize learning, for, for example. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I mean, I read today that, that John Swin is um, mooted the idea that we might uh, scrap exams in 2021. Now that's a shift, um, but it might be a temporary shift, but that doesn't happen in a vacuum, as you say. And there are a whole host of educational questions that need to be asked. I mean, I don't actually think it's a, a bad thing to move away from summative examinations. I don't actually think that's a, a problem. I think there are all sorts of socio-political and, 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 and uh, inclusion problems to do with, with uh, continuous assessment, but we can get over that. But, but I do think what we're seeing now is a, is a challenge to the notion of what it means to be and become a teacher. And, and what, what concerns me is that we lose all that and we simply go back to where we were before. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us, whether it's through technology or other things, to be thinking about ways in which we can get people to think more broadly about the role for a teacher and about the relationship with children and young people, for example. And, and the Minecraft one you, you give is an, is an interesting situation. I mean, there you have somebody who's engaged with what many see as being a complete waste of time. I mean, I don't myself, my, my kids have played it and, and actually one's 17 and one's 18 and they still play it together, you know. So that's, a, and, and it's a good thing. And, it, and, it, and, it, and, and although we can, we can talk about the physics and the problems with the physics of it, but it, it, you know, it, 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 it enables them to immerse themselves in a particular world. And that child saying, and I feel more included in school and I feel part of school. But surely that's a, a you know a good thing, but surely also the question then needs to be asked. So what needs to change in school, or what has changed in school, for that to actually happen? And was that question asked? I mean, I don't know. You know. Yeah. Can, can I just you you use the phrase becoming there? Uh, one of our colleagues at the University of Dundee, uh, Dr. Duncan Mercesa, uh, he wrote a paper in 2013 called "Becoming Teachers: Desiring Students." Right, it's a really, really interesting uh, paper. And what he does is, uh, well, he 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 he, uh, he frames it in this Deleuze Guattari materialistic framework. Okay, yeah. that people can maybe write find out a bit more about that. But what he does is, he looks at the uh, the in the book Matilda, uh, where Miss Honey meets Matilda, and and Matilda knows all her times tables and can do all the mathematics stuff, and she's really taken with this, and she gives that. That I, it talks about that moment of, of becoming for, for the teacher, Miss Honey, and mm -hmm. seeing Matilda as something, oh, this is, how, how do you know this? And, and how did you manage this? And, and, and I think that this idea of becomings is an interesting one that for, for learners, we need to give them the opportunity to become something and to, and to, and to keep on becoming in our, in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. But the same applies to us as teachers. Mm -hmm. This situation is going to have an impact on what we become. And, mm -hmm. and continue to become. So mm -hmm. I think that this is going to change, well, it's got the potential to, to change how we are and who we are as educators. And I, and I, I think that the paradigm shifts, et cetera, that have happened in the, over the past few weeks are really quite remarkable in terms of the shift to the digital space and the, the hunger for involvement in things like this and things like that outdoor learning uh, mm -hmm. seminar I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, is this the time in which digital mm -hmm. technologies and digital tools and spaces are really going to start to become uh, more uh, central to how people think about their practice in, in a critical fashion. On that note of becoming, I'm just going to chip in there because um, we have five minutes left. Um, Derek, I think that you are able to discuss your work as um, heading up the Scottish Council Deans of Education National Framework for Digital Literacies. Are you able to share anything with us about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what it is, folks, uh, as, a, as a result, uh, I think it was a part of the digital learning and teaching policy, uh, a strategy that came out from Scottish government. There was an expectation that the that there would be uh, the, the, init the initial teacher education providers would work together to put together a, a framework uh, of expectation of what uh, respect of teacher education students would get on their early career programmes with us. And so, over the past uh, year and a bit. We have all been working together to put together a, a national framework for, for digital literacies and in initial teacher education. And it's going to be published in a couple of weeks' time. So in that, what we're looking at is a range of things, uh, the history of digital technology and, and, and teaching and learning. We're looking at the, what the concepts of digital literacies are. We're looking at how to ensure that, that this idea of digital literacies and digital uh, teaching and learning permeates beyond 
the domain of somebody like me and my colleague who is, are seen as the, the, the IT people. Uh, we've created a, a framework of six uh, themes that range from uh, computing science to digital pedagogy to CLPL to research and foreign practice. And so we're actually all working together to almost crowdsource our expertise, our understanding of what we do. We're much more now, our, all the ITEs across Scotland are much more now connected than we were in the past in this particular aspect with digital tools and learning. And we're going to be hopefully uh, putting together a series of vignettes as well, talking about what we do in our programs and our courses that's informed by the research and the theory and how that then makes its mark in the early career uh, experiences of our teachers. Uh, so that's what we've been doing, Carrie, which will be released in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we hope that will contribute to the ongoing discussion and debates and understanding about the place of digital tools and uh, spaces in education. And will that articulate in a um, sensible way with, for instance, the new GT GTCS standards when they come out? I understand oh, yes, there may oh, be additional yes. The, the GTCS standards like are, already, are already built into it, but that will accommodate the, the changes. We've actually been working with GTCS as well in terms of uh, responding to the call, the consultation about the new standards. So we've been discussing that with them as well in terms of uh, additions or uh, changes they could maybe make. So those discussions have been going and GTCS have been receptive to that. Okay, th thanks very much, Derek. Um, I'm going to give a final couple of minutes back to our chair, Nicola Karst, to just talk about our upcoming events. But before I do so, uh, I'd just like to thank you, Derek, particularly for um, giving us your time. And I would like to thank all the participants. I'm sure, I'm, what, I'm hoping that some of you are managing to sit in your gardens in the sun. <laughs> And enjoy a bit of our nice weather while, while you've been listening. Um, so, and thanks for all the comments. I'm sorry if we haven't managed to bring in all the comments. I hope that you, you've all enjoyed reading the comments posted. Um, over to you, Nicola. Um, yeah, thank you. I reiterate that. Thank you very much to Carrie for chairing this session and asking Derek the questions and for Derek for agreeing to be in conversation with us. And the quality of the questions and conversation on the chat has been brilliant. So sorry we couldn't share all of the points and questions, but um, really good thoughts there. Um, the last thing to do is just to um, emphasise we've got another um, sessions coming up. So our CEDA Connect sessions are fortnightly um, and our next session's happening in June. Um, I'll just share my screen with you just now so that you can see the events that we have coming up in June. Um, we have the Teacher Education Network of CIRA leading the event on the 11th of June, and that's uh, Paul Adams, who you've heard from today, and Dr. Amy Burns from the University of Calgary. And they'll be talking about um, what, IT, what should IT be about and what should it hope to achieve, and we'll get some interesting perspectives there, both from a Scottish and Canadian perspective. And uh, as per this um, event, you register through Eventbrite. Our next event on the 25th of June is being led by the Scottish Physical Education Research Network, and they've got a panel discussion with um, teachers, head teachers, deputy head teachers, who will be talking about um, health and well-being and COVID-19 and supporting young people in their transition back to school. So probably quite well timed there and thinking about um, as we start to think about um, next year from this month and heading into August. So um, I think that will be a really interesting session as well. And again, um, the link is there to register through Eventbrite. Um, we also have two future events in July planned, which we have not got um, Eventbrite set up for yet, but they will be coming in June with Professor Mark Priestley from the University of Stirling talking about the curriculum of Scotland and then in conversation with uh, Professor Walter Humes talking about Scottish education there in July. Um, so thank you everybody for attending our event today. Um, it's been great to see so many people here. We've had over 50 people attending the session today, so great to see you all. Hope you can hopefully attend some of our sessions in June. And remember, um, you can find out more about CIRA on our website and look out for us on Twitter. And remember that hashtag, um, hashtag CIRA Connects, if you're having any dis discussions following this. Great to see everybody, um, and thank you very much. Thanks especially to Derek and Carrie. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. See you in a couple of weeks.